Hi and welcome to the Homeopathy Health Show. I am Ati Kamadbati, a fourth generation homeopath with over 20 years of professional experience in this field of healing. In the Homeopathy Health Show, I'll be talking all things homeopathy and natural with guest interviews, tips and advice and answering some of your questions. Homeopathy is truly a unique complementary system of healing suitable for all ages, young and old. I'd love to hear from you and welcome your questions on homeopathy and how it can or has helped you. Feel free to email me at health at liketreatslike.co.uk or visit www.liketreatslike.co.uk for more information. Once you're there, take a look at the Knowledge Academy and blog section where you will find interesting information. Both sections are growing day by day, so always check back. So let's begin today's show on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio, real feel-good radio. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Homeopathy Health Podcast here on UK Health Radio. So I hope and pray you are well, and indeed hope and pray it continues to be that way. I've had a very, very busy week with uh, back-to-back podcasts, actually, and um, good time for reflection as well. I'm so grateful for this opportunity to be able to speak to so many homeopaths from around the world who share this uh, passion and dedication and commitment to serve humanity and to relieve suffering. Now, uh, today, I'm continuing on my conversation with Tony Pincus, who is the owner and chief pharmacist at Ainsworth's Homeopathic Pharmacy in London. Last week, Tony introduced himself, and we were talking about a great many things to do with healing, homeopathy, and really his journey to homeopathy and actually working at Ainsworth's Pharmacy. And uh, we continue that conversation this week. So this is part two of my podcast with Tony Pincus of Ainsworth's Pharmacy. Absolutely. And it's also um, books inspire, of course, no doubt about that, absolutely. But as far as homeopathy is concerned, until you've witnessed it, until you've seen it work on yourself or a loved one or a friend of a friend, yeah, that's that's the game changer, isn't it? That's totally a unique experience to you, um, to an individual. And, uh, you know, that's the one that gets lasting results um, because it totally changes your, your whatever you've read. You know, it once you've seen something in practice, you think, oh, wow, you know, this is really something. And I've read that, uh, you know, Belladonna, for example, very good for scarlet fever, proving says this, this, and this, you know, these these are the symptoms. But until you uh, actually treat somebody for scarlet fever and they're cured of it, um, you know, you, you don't actually appreciate perhaps the, the real power of homeopathy. And interestingly enough, um, I, w- I treated a child about, um, where are we, a couple of months ago, who actually had scarlet fever, diagnosed as scarlet fever, which is a bit surprising. But nevertheless, um, in the UK, and of course, you know, Belladonna, and uh, it's gone. You know, after three days, there, there was no, there was no fever, no, no redness, no sign of anything at all, um, no swelling, whatnot. So, it's you know, it almost leaves the parents uh, stunned sometimes that oh, I don't understand. It just looks like a a tablet that you dissolve on the tongue or a sweet globule. You know, how what's in there? Because they all look the same, which is an is that, interesting question, isn't it? <laughs> but it, but it? It is. But then, of course, you have to shift that over to uh, an understanding that it's not the medicine that is doing the work. It's the body that's being mm. stimulated by the medicine to do the work. So you know, I remember coming into work one day and and I felt absolutely awful and, you know, quite sick. And I had this terrible pain in my in my lower abdomen on the left hand side and I started to have all sorts of imaginings that there was an inflammation in, in my gut, and and, and um, I should have known more. But I, I, you know, for whatever reason, when you don't feel well, you kind of lose your marbles. And yeah. and I and I noticed that if I moved suddenly, it was 
the jarring motion was agonizing. And there was a friend of mine who was a homeopathic doctor around the corner, and I rang him up and said, can you see me? And he said, okay, step on the couch. And he examined me, and he prodded me, and he said, oh, you've got an inflammation of the sigmoid flexure. And, you know, the specific remedy is scrofularia no dosa, but meanwhile, here's a dose of Belladonna 10M. And he came round from his desk, and and he um, he got hold of the Belladonna 10M. And now I was feeling... A the pain felt like a small marble of burning heat in my gut. It was a burning pain, and it was very painful. And if I moved suddenly, it magnified it. And the rest of my body was was a bit chilly, and I felt slightly nauseous. And he put a cap full of granules, the belladonna tenem, onto my tongue. And he went back, and he sat behind his desk, and he just looked at me. And within 30 seconds, I felt what I can only describe as something out of Star Trek. You know, the, you know, when it goes warp factor five, mm. it was this, this ball, this burning ball that was in my gut suddenly went like this and it exploded. But the heat from that ball generated just spread all over my body as a uniform heat. And I started to sweat and tug at my collar. And he looked at me and grinned, you know, <laughs> and the pain had gone. Now, as a pharmacist, I can tell you that there isn't a drug on the market that could have done that. Not an antibiotic, not an opiate, nothing. Hmm. Because um, I didn't I didn't try to palliate. I didn't try to suppress the pain. Um, the, you know, what happened was that that was a process that was initiated by the remedy and was was experienced in in, in me. And and the remedy can do whatever the body is capable of doing. You know, if the body is capable of of activating its immune system, or the body is capable of responding in in in, a, in an anti-inflammatory way, that's what it will do. Um, and and I think the, the the difficulty we face in this day and age is that there's this very pejorative um, understanding, this very attitude towards homeopathy that it's a it's some sort of toy town imagination that's um, that's not real, that doesn't have any scientific validity. And yet, if you ask the people that say that to produce evidence that there's no evidence, they they run for the hills because they can quote some idea of trials that they say that that, that prove it doesn't work. But what they're doing is cherry picking the evidence. So we know we know that. But the interesting thing is that. Most of the antipathy towards homeopathy is generated by this biased opinion that's not scientific. It's saying, well, it can't possibly work because it doesn't fit in my box. And I'm not interested and go away and stop bothering me, you know. And this is, this is the data, but, you know, and, and, and that, yes, will allow you to use it for, you know, mild, um, non, you know, non, non troubling complaints. You know, you, you can, you're allowed to market it for minor self-limiting conditions from a regulatory point of view. And I remember, <laughs> it always reminds me that, you know, many years ago I had um, my my ex-wife was was working in a design agency and one of the designers had gone away and it, he cut himself and it was, he got a um, an infection and the infection was a streptococcal necrotizing fasciitis strain. And there were a couple of events around that time where these fleshy, it was called flesh eating bug. Hmm. And none of the antibiotics available were, were capable of, of, of treating this condition. And I said to her, um, well, what happened? She said, well, he was in France and he went to a hospital. They sent him over. He was in St. Thomas's and, um, and, and he had one surgeon and one clinician associate attached to him. And basically, they were just negotiating how much flesh to cut away from from his left hand flank, and that, and and at the point of which I said, "Well, you know, do you want to get? Do you want? Do you want me to help?" And she said, "No, no, no, don't get involved." His life expectancy was fifty percent. So I said, right. "Okay, fine. I, I I'm not you know not interested in getting involved unless anybody wants some help." And a couple of weeks later. Uh, these two people came into the shop. It was his brother and his father. And they looked very glum. And they said, well, 
his life expectancy is down to 20%. Hmm. And he's on the, he's intubated on morphine. Um, he's in a kind of coma and he's on the drug of last resort, which is vancomycin. And they don't, they, they don't give him more than 12 hours to live because his temperature won't stabilize on the vancomycin and there was nothing else. And they said, is there anything? Is there anything that you can offer, you know, as a, you know, to, to consider? So I said, okay. And, that, and we had a potency of the strep necrotizing fasciitis and we had some pyrogen and some arsenic in my side. So I mixed these together. I said, look, here's some liquid. Go and moisten his, his tongue with that and see what happens. I'm not making any promises, but it's at least something you can do rather mm-hmm. than standing in my shop looking glum. And within 12 hours, his temperature stabilized. He made a full recovery. And he came into the shop several months later after he recovered, hobbling around on a stick saying, you know, to, to, to thank. And I think the, the kind of the miracles that we've all seen in homeopathy are a, a privilege, as I said, to all of us and a benefit for all of us. And, and I think we all want to share those. And I think the important thing is that we need to understand that that there's only a certain community of people who are ready to to understand that, to appreciate it, and that that shouldn't in any way deter us from our enthusiasm. Absolutely, that's actually a very very pertinent point that you've made there, and uh, it's such a it's such a, a, re- a truly rewarding opportunity for any homeopath to be in a position to be able to help and serve humanity, because ultimately that's what it is. Um, serving humanity. It could be one person a week. It could be 20 people a day. It could be 50. You know, I know some doctors are treating 100, 150 people uh, a day, which is mind boggling, of course, but uh, that's their commitment. And, you know, they, they're very, very good at it with very good results. And it, it's so incredible, isn't it? It's, it's like uh, the best feeling is to be able to wake up and think, yeah, do you know what? I've, I've, I've got a good, it's not a job, is it? It's a service. You know, um, I, blessed to be in this. Um, <coughs> excuse me, in the, in this service as such. I wanted to ask you about uh, your interest in the batch flower remedies um, and how they've been helping. I know we were talking just before the podcast about uh, your experiences with now using batch flower remedies uh, as a very important tool alongside conventional homeopathic remedies. So please do share your interest there and and your insight and experiences of that. Thank you. Yeah, I think for um, the longest time, I had this, um, I think most homeopaths have a kind of snobbish attitude towards batch flower remedies. They think there's only 38 of them, and they don't make a lot of sense, and the groups don't make a lot of sense, and um, how can they be taken seriously? And and should we be able to use those alongside homeopathic Mm. remedies? And won't they, won't they, won't they queer the pitch? And, and I, um, and I struggled with these for a long period of time. And back in 97, um, I had some fairly serious practitioners come to me and said, can you please make the batch flower remedies? And I said, well, why? And there's other people making them. Well, we're not happy with those and we want you to make them. And, and so I said, okay, it's not rocket science. It's like floating flowers on water and they're not succussed. And so I said, okay, I'll make them. And they, they immediately said, that's fine. We're happy with them. And they started buying them. And I, I was at that point, I was okay. I was okay making them, but I had no interest in, in using them. And every time I looked at how they were used and I looked at the, the titles for the groups, I thought, well, this is just confusing. I don't, I really don't get it. I can't get my head around this. And in 2006, we started a course. In, you know, a very short course, like a two-day course, introductory course, and then uh, a more advanced course. And we brought some people in who are practitioners of batch flower remedies, and they taught it. They taught the students how to use them. And I, you know, went on the course, and I still thought, well, I'm not really that in favour of it. And in 2012, um, my, my my partner at the time came up with, we were literally gifted from nature with a different way of using them, um, a very much more intuitive way of using them, mm-hmm. in which the emphasis was handed uh, over to the patient. And the, the difference between bachelor remedies and the principle of, of those and, and homeopathic remedies 
is fairly simple. It's that um, Batch said that um, Hanneman could only do so much in his lifetime. I mean, he was a genius. and uh, uh, But the thing that he wasn't comfortable with was that he didn't find that Batch, that uh, Hanneman had gone far enough. Mm. Uh, he said, first of all, um, you know, Batch had introduced the Balnosos, which had made him pretty famous and wealthy in terms of his practice. But in using nosos, Batch resented the fact that he was using what he considered to be a negative to cure a negative, because he felt that if you cure a negative with a negative, you leave a void in in the patient, a spiritual void in the patient. And he felt that he wanted to change that. He wanted to to leave a you know use a positive to cure a negative. So there was a spiritual dimension that, that Batch introduced with Bachelor Remedies, which he was never, ever successful in transmitting to the practitioner base. And so he became an outsider, uh, and he ended up using what were, were effectively herbal remedies to treat, enable the public to treat themselves. And the spiritual dynamic the dimension that he brought in kind of withered on the vine. So, you know, I was guided to kind of pick this up and work with it. And, uh, you know, nature wanted a voice. It wanted to represent itself and, and, and present an understanding of how to use these remedies in a much more dynamic, fundamentally easy, far more accurate and rapid way. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. And so I started using them um, by encouraging the patients to do the pick. And because the patient was, the only thing the patient required was a willingness to, to be involved. And by giving that willingness, the the free will of the patient um, was granted to the extent that their guiding intelligence nudged them to receive a message. And the message that they got from their, themselves via their guiding intelligence was, this is what you're doing, and this is why you're in the state that you're complaining about. And the delivery wasn't done through their mind, it was done through feeling. Because mm. the delivery with bachelor remedies is very instantaneous. It, it doesn't take a long time because as soon as the patient takes the remedy, by taking these remedies, the effect is instantaneous. Within 30 seconds, I was seeing patients registering a response to the remedies, doing it this way around. And then it became a question of, well, if you're giving yourself a message, and this is something fundamental that you need to understand, are you aware of what it is that you're trying to show yourself? And if not, I will assist you by decoding the meaning of each of these remedies, mm. because what they present is a, is a, is a string of cause and effect. And so what we do now at Ainsworth all day long is people are coming in and, and, and they're, 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 they're using the, 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 the batch remedy kit that we make and, they're choosing the remedies and then they're having this revelation. Um, and, and frequently they're, they're having an epiphany. And as I mentioned to you, the interesting thing is that is that the revelation can end in an epiphany where the patient suddenly recognizes what it is they're doing. You know, they're kind of reliving various traumatic issues in their life or they're leaving, reliving the events that led them to your door and they suddenly recognize hang on a minute, why am I doing that? And so we can boil it, distill it down into the fact that what are we trying to do is to encourage the patient to learn the life lesson they came in to learn by empowering them and giving them an opportunity to, to, come, to come in and learn exactly what they need to know in the moment. So it's a bit like looking in a big mirror and that mirror is incredibly truthful 
And that truth is inescapable. The person will say, well, well, in the moment, yes, I recognize that that's what I'm doing. I'm choosing this pattern of behavior, which is the thing that I don't like the consequences of and why I came to you in the first place. And they certainly recognize that by taking the remedy, it's almost like doing the tarot. You know, when you go to a tarot reader, they, mm. they say, well, this is what's going on with you. You pick the three cards. Um, but with tarot, uh, there, there is the presentation of the problem without a resolution. It's like that Jack Nicholson film, as good as it gets, where he goes mm. to the psychiatrist and, and the guy says, well, this is what's going on. He says, I'm drowning and you're describing the water. You know, so, <laughs> so, so this is, this is, this is, but this is different because apart from the obvious where it's showing you what's going on and why it unpins, it unplugs the, uh, the energy to the, to the resistance pattern. And so what happens is when the person tries to use that resistance, they get a very sudden headache or a heaviness or, or, a, or, a, or, or a signifier that says to you, it's not available to you anymore. And, and so they, 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 they give up. They give up trying to use it. And as soon as they start to give up and they start to acknowledge and to accept the choice that they're making, they suddenly realize that they're, that they're, they're empowered to make a different choice. And this is extraordinary because it happens really, really quickly. And the person suddenly recognizes the choices that they're making that led them to the position that they're in. And so we see that those choices are basically their life lessons that have visited them in terms of symptoms. Um, and, and then the symptoms might vanish immediately because the way that batch was working wasn't f- like, um, so much with homeopathy where we're focusing on the, the symptoms and trying to remove them, but with, we're, we're focusing on the attitude of the patient towards the symptoms. And once we deal with their attitude and remove the the blocks that they have towards dealing with the issue of the symptoms, um, rather than saying it's not fair, these things shouldn't be visited on me so I can learn from them, uh, because at that point you'll you create a drama on top of the the lesson. Now, when you when you remove the drama and you just say, okay, it's I get it, I'm supposed to have this lesson. There's something to learn from it. You recognize that the only way you learn your lessons is by going through the experience of learning the lesson. You can't mm. learn the lesson by ducking the lesson. Uh, and so this is fundamental. Now, why is that important? Well, because if you've had cases in homeopathy where, you know, you had somebody coming to you over and over again for years and you're not really making any progress, using this particular method, I call it the ABC method, um, certainly, you know, with our remedies, which are made in a very balanced way, uh, to enable people to, to come to terms with that lesson. It literally opens the case it, because it, it's not a process of just you asking questions and then, or the patient divulging what they wish to divulge. Mm. Because the, one of the disadvantages of the traditional process of, of, of consultation is that you're taking on face value what the patient is saying. Now, suppose they're lying to you. (laughs) Suppose they're trying to collude with you so they can carry on doing the same thing. They want to come to you so they can carry on eating the sweets and not have the fillings. (laughs) And, you know, there is that element to therapy. There is that, there is that, that desire for, you know, you to collude with them so that they can remove the consequences of their crisis without changing who they're being. And, and so that's why I find that blending these together isn't contradictory. It's actually constructive. So uh, as far as applicability is concerned, I mean, I, as you were, as you were talking about this, uh, it's very, all very fascinating as well. It's a very powerful tool. It seems for self realization, self acceptance, coming to terms with where you are at that moment in time. But from there, is it very much, I know you've just explained, but would you say it's more related to chronic conditions or can it be used across the board as such? Um, Nowadays, the myriad of emotional imbalances, mental health conditions, this surely this is a very powerful, powerful tool. 
it, it is. And um, I, I think for the most part, I'm using it with people who largely are expressive. They're, they're open with their feelings. They're honest with their feelings. Um, and, but, but, but with anybody, I mean, I, I, you know, we even have people bringing their pets into the shop and, and we, we're even using it with pets. So we're not limited to children or pets. Um, you know, because it's essentially the technique takes two minutes and the process is it doesn't require you to believe in it, doesn't require you to understand it. It simply acquires, requires you to, to agree to participate, you know, and I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I teach a two day course in it on Zoom, which enables practitioners to understand how they un- unwrap the narrative that comes out of, of the far end of it, because it's very much a process of interacting with the patient in which where, whereby you can feel the changes going on in them and they can, you know, we're, we're, we're having a different dialogue. It's more of a feeling dialogue, which is being recognized on both ends. Mm-hmm. And that's fascinating because when I'm teaching classes of this in Japan or Bulgaria or Turkey where the people don't speak English, that's not a block to communication. You know, you can look at somebody and you can feel the energy shift very suddenly and you kind of look at each other and you both know. And then it could be it could be translated in in, in any language you like. But the feeling um has the truth associated with it. And it's it's a very rapid form of communication. And the beauty of that is that um, what has come out of that is that is an understanding of the way that batch flower remedies are working in the groups. The groups are essentially blocks in the chakras. They're, they're simply blocks where the person has become oversensitive or under or over overreactive in certain mm-hmm. of the centers, and and these then lead to pathological changes. If the issue isn't, isn't resolved enough. So in the throat chakra, for example, you know, if the person is ducking out of the moment and they're not present in the present moment, they're not present in the moment of creation. And therefore they're making choices, which they're not even aware of or not responsible for. And then if you keep going on and on and on in that direction, that leads to all sorts of problems in the throat you have a cough, a sore throat, and eventually you have thyroid problems. And, mm. and and the interesting thing is that the remedies start resolving these very, very rapidly. So the, the changes that I see, you know, the pathological changes you see, even with physical conditions, with the, with just the bachelor remedies, happen very, very rapidly. Um, and you can use, you know, homeopathic remedies alongside that, and there's a perfect marriage between the two. Anyone listening who's interested in the courses, do they just go onto the website and uh, register? Yeah, I mean, we have a you know I do courses in this on um, on Zoom, and frequently we have people rocking up from Australia to to America, and you know sitting there watching people using matchsticks to keep their eyes open at four o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning. But <laughs> but I'm but I'm teaching this around you know on zoom around the world and 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 there is no cultural problem you know i mean whether i'm teaching in japan or australia or bulgaria or turkey there the 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 um the the english you know the batch flower remedies the original flower essences are 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 just a wonderful series of remedies which um like homeopathic remedies they they teach you so much and you can see how you're not trying to fit the patient to the remedy, but you're fitting the, pa- the remedy to the patient. Uh, and, and this is wonderful training for, for homeopaths because, you know, it's, you know, how, 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 you know, young homeopaths are constantly getting flummoxed by lots of remedies and they don't know which one to give. And you open the book and you think, well, that one must fit. And then you try to fit it to the patient. Whereas mm. in the case of, um, this method, it's very much a question of understanding the nuances of the remedy by seeing how a remedy picture is manifest in the patient. Um, and, and you can, you, you see, oh yes, I, now I understand it. How I, I tweak my understanding, not, not tweaking 
the the remedy to fit the patient. Fascinating. Tony, I wanted to talk to you about your royal connection. You are honoured to be the grantee of actually three royal warrants uh, of appointment from two, rather, the late uh, Queen Mother, uh, the late and greatly missed Her Majesty the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, and now King Charles III. And I also know that you are consulted on matters concerning homeopathic remedies by the royal family. So do do share about that. And, and uh, it's uh, such a nice uh, honour that you have any house and uh, what it's like. The, the fact is that the royal family have been very much uh, interested in homeopathy for many, many generations. And, you know, there, there, is a, there is this undercurrent within British society where there's a large number of people who, who through their family connections, have been brought up with homeopathy. They passed it on. Um, you know, the, the charities, the homeopathic charities have survived by bequests from grateful patients. That's where the money came from. I mean, it, I can't tell you, it's incredibly difficult to, to, to get charitable donations for homeopathy because you're asking to support a concept, hmm. not sick children. You know, if you, if you go out, you know, Great Ormond Street Hospital says, you know, shows you a picture of a starving child or a a child that's sick, people throw, you know, any amount of money at it. But if you say, can you give me some money for homeopathy? That isn't a, a sexy, uh, charitable, charitable support. And so the support comes on the back end where, you know, people are grateful for the benefit that they receive. So, and this goes all the way down from all the realms of society. And John Ainsworth was involved with. The, the the royal warrants at when he was at Nelson's and then when he left Nelson's they they moved to Ainsworth's um and you know and they, the reason they went there is that Marjorie Blackie who was the queen's homeopathic physician at the time was very trusting of John and, and wanted to bring her prescriptions to him he ended up with the warrants for the queen mother and the queen in 1980 and when I took over, I applied for the for the warrant for the Prince of Wales, who's now, of course, uh, King Charles the Third. And there's always a kind of misunderstanding in 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 you know that the the the, 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 the king and the, the former prince was the one who was interested in alternative medicine and or in the homeopathy. But but this is something that's a generational thing. You know, it came through his mother and his grandmother in particular were very keen on homeopathy. The Queen Mother was a fabulous supporter and patron of the British Homeopathic Association for many years. She hosted events. She went around the homeopathic hospital, as did the Queen during the war years. Um, and, you know, uh, 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 they were the ones who instilled that that uh, degree of interest in, in their grandson who's now the king. So, um, and because he's interested, he's been using it that both for himself and, 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 and his cattle, you know, I've made up remedies for and trained his, his, his herdsmen who, who were using it to treat their cattle. And, and by the same token, you know, the, that the queen was always keen to move around from one palace to another with a set of remedies. She, she liked to keep them close. And there was a time I remember where I got um uh I got a call from from her her dresser who said, um, well, you know, I found these homeopathic remedies that you know that the Queen has and they all look a bit old. Can you come and have a look at them? So I said, Okay. So so I got on put on a suit and went up to the palace and uh, and this is before they, they tarted up the palace and there were threadbare carpets and it looked a bit bit sparse, and I was invited into the royal apartments. And I'm waiting outside in in the corridor with policemen at both ends. And suddenly the 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 the, the door opens, and a lady comes out and said, "Well, the Queen will see you now." And I wasn't expecting to see the Queen, but they <laughs> mm. brought me in, and there was just me and the Queen there for forty minutes with a table full of all these remedies. And I looked at them, and I thought, "Well, these are really old and." 
nobody's looked at these for donkey's years, and there were handwritten notes to her father, you know, King George, um, saying from Sir John Weir and Marjorie Blackie saying, well, if you have a problem, take this and this and this. And I looked at them, I said, well, you know, these are a bit old. I think, you know, I'm really sorry, but I think we're going to have to replace all of them. And she looked at me and there was this kind of stare. And then she said, oh, she said, that sounds as though it's going to be terribly expensive. (laughs) (laughs) And I said, I just thought my my head went into spin. I thought, you know, this is the one of the wealthiest women in the entire on the planet, and she's worried about the cost and and that mm. kind of level of frugality was 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 quite amusing. And um, and then there was a one tincture in there. As a as a remember, there's a tincture that was so old, it had solidified at the bottom of the vessel. And and I said, look, look at this, and well, I held it and under her nose and she reeled backwards and then the following day um, a limousine turned up outside the pharmacy with a footman who got out with long dress coat and he walked into the pharmacy with with a hand-blown one millimeter vial of the same tincture that I'd held under her nose and said that he'd come from the queen mother Hmm. and would I replace this this vial (laughs) of one one mil of, of of tincture and I had this impression of the, the mother and daughter talking to each other over the phone, saying, Oh, you mother, you must go and check that remedy and, 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 and see if you can replace it. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. So there was there, there, that that level of interest um, was definitely evident from you know from a very uh, uh, early days, and and even though that the, the you know that it was there the the queen and and the, the queen mother both had uh, homeopathic doctors who were who were who were present who were members of the royal household and. Um, uh, you know, uh, and that was the case, and 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 even literally months before uh, the, the, the Queen passed, she replaced her medicine. You know, she replaced mm. her medicine, and and I was I was informed that although she didn't use them much, she loved the comfort they gave her, carrying them around from one palace to another because the. You have to understand that even in this day and age, you have a number of different palaces, and there's still that rather medieval approach of of a train going from one palace to another, carrying everything that's necessary from one to another. And she took great comfort in in, in having those remedies to her side. And I think the prince, now the king, um, you know, is is familiar and comfortable using you know what's been handed down to him. Have you had the opportunity to speak or or, or, or see the king um, since the passing of uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth? Um, I saw the the Prince of Wales um, as part of a group of cam therapies that um, uh, you know because he's 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 always been ahead of his time. You see the prince's trust, you know, which was which was ridicule when he when he brought it out. But look at it now; it's actually firmly accepted, and it's looked mm. at as a magnificent organisation. And there's lots of things that he's come out with, which uh, initially were deeply unpopular with people who were who were sort of taking a snipe at him. But he is still passionate about complementary and alternative medicine and homeopathy in particular. Um, and uh, there, I think in the um, in in the years to come, we'll see how hopefully he's he's taking a lead in that. I know um, in the in the in, in, in about two thousand and ten, I I you know just after two thousand and ten, he asked me to write a report on what was going on in Cuba, and um, 
I'm not sure how much people know about this, but I remember being at my desk in the pharmacy and getting a call from the British consulate in Havana saying, would I like to attend and present at a conference on homeoprophylaxis in Havana? Mm. And I thought it was a wind-up. I thought, what's, what's going on? Why? I didn't even know there was any homeopathy in Cuba. Mm. And I said, well, who's hosting this? And she said, oh, it's the state vaccine company. And I kind of, my ears pricked up and I thought, how come Big Pharma is hosting a conference on homeoprophylaxis? And and I thought, this doesn't make any sense. And and I, I was deeply skeptical. And I think about a week later, I saw um the 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 erstwhile Peter Fisher, who was the 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 um the editor of Simile, the editor of the faculty of journal, faculty's homeopathic journal and and the con- chief consultant at the homeopathic hospital. And I said, Peter, who who are these people? He said, Oh, they're wonderful people, but they've got no money and you'll you probably have to pay for your own airfare and you probably have to pay to get into the conference and you'll probably have to pay to speak. <laughs> so mm. I said, okay. He said, but they're, it's worth going. So I went over there. I was the only person from England who went over there mm. and they, you know, they welcomed me with open arms and they said, well, you know, I, I presented the work I'd done on homeoprophylaxis with lots of farmers in the UK and then they got up and they completely blew everybody's socks off with a presentation they did. And this was extraordinary because as the state vaccine company, um, they had come to the conclusion that the, the, the main disease that they were treating, the main disease that they were trying to prevent, which was leptospirosis, which is wheels disease, which is caused every year by hurricanes coming into Cuba, smashing against the northeastern seaboard uh causing floods you know the electricity would go down uh the the floods the 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 destruction would create these areas where there was dirty water and there was rats in the water and people with with cuts would walk through this water and potentially get um you know serious liver failure as a consequence of leptospirosis so what they would do is they would wanted to vaccinate all of the population of this area um against leptospirosis but because of the u.s embargo the only money that they had in cuba was um, charitable donations from canada and japan and with this money they were able to make enough vaccine two shots of vaccine for just under forty thousand people in this area and the woman who ran the vaccine company was had a very big heart and she wanted to do more and her husband was in the you know running the health department and all their friends were running university sites so you had this very strange situation in which there was a country here with an intelligent population intelligent people in control who were not suffering the hegemony of big pharma and could run, write their own script unaffected by that and with that, they, you know, she'd gone around the world and she'd heard about batch flower remedies. She'd heard about homeopathy and she turned around to her, her, her guys and she said, what would happen if we made a homeopathic remedy to these polyvalent strains of leptospirosis that we've got in our lab? And they said, we don't know. We're not homeopaths. And she said, well, let's do it. And in 2007, the motivation for this was the floods came early. So they couldn't vaccinate people in time. And so they needed an emergency op- option. And so they, they created with a very small element of their budget, um, you know, enough for 2.3 million people, which didn't have to go through a cold chain, which could be, which could be modified very rapidly, not within a year as the conventional vaccine which could be given to anybody under the age of 15, which the vaccine couldn't, which didn't need a doctor or nurse to give it, and which they could distribute within weeks and didn't have to be kept in a fridge because it wasn't part of that problem. And if the electricity has gone down, fridges aren't much good to you, and, and nurses and doctors are in short supply to administer a vaccine. So they gave this, and they showed how statistically – it reduced the incidence of, of the disease by 84%. Mm. 
And this to them was just extraordinary. And I was at this conference and it was like there was a buzz, you know, half of the third world were there and they were saying, what about preventing malaria? What about preventing tuberculosis? What about Chagas disease in South America? Hmm. And suddenly you had this whole sense of, you know, homeopathy being used to free, you know, the, the third world developing countries from the hegemony of big farm and giving them an opportunity for a primary healthcare system, which you now see in, in, in India, you now see in South America developing much more rapidly than anywhere else. And yet they couldn't get the paper published. They couldn't get the paper published in a mainstream journal. And this is where we're at now, where impeccable research in homeopathy is almost impossible to publish in a mainstream journal because of these antipathy towards homeopathy and this is this is the problem that we're facing at the moment nevertheless the fact that you were able to take part in this and 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 drive something like this is uh, extremely admirable have you have you had a chance to go back and to review and how things are going it's very sad because the vaccine company <clears throat> i think some money came in from america america's trying to move into cuba they removed the director with the open heart who wanted to stimulate the study in the first place. The company, the chief scientist has gone to Australia to work with uh, Isaac Golden and working in Flinders. And they've removed the word homeopathy from anything to do with their products. Hmm. So there's a certain degree of amnesia that's crept in. And um, despite the fact that it was an incredibly successful conference. And what they were doing was later they, I, you know, I did speak to them and they said, well, during the swine flu the following year, they produced 10 million doses of swine flu to go to the population. Hmm. And this is probably where the wheels came off because that swine flu was, if you remember, a non-event. You know, in this country, we spent 1.26 billion pounds on producing a vaccine for swine flu and, and giving it to everybody and there were only 26 deaths in the uk of which half of those weren't even attributed to swine flu it was money down the drain and i think that might have been used as an excuse to bury the the homeopathic side of the company but in the pandemic cuba came up with um uh, sort of a, a kitchen sink preparation, which they called, I can't remember, they, they came up with a name for it, which wasn't produced by the vaccine company, but a homeopathic clinic somewhere in the middle of Cuba, which became very popular as a, as a, as a prophylaxis. And that was part two of my podcast with Tony Pincus from Ainsworth's Homeopathic Pharmacy. Truly fascinating, wasn't it, to hear about the intuitive use of the batch flower remedies. And I was truly uh, mesmerized, I think, is, is the right word, by the wonderful story of the late Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and how Tony was summoned to Buckingham Palace. And um, he was met not only by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, but also the homeopathic remedies which were on the table as such a wonderful insight and such a wonderful story itself and of course to know the history of the involvement or the interest in homeopathy from the royal family itself is is quite fascinating next week i'll be continuing with my conversation with tony the last part actually of this special three-part podcast until then stay safe I do hope you've enjoyed the Homeopathy Health Show here on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. Tune in next time for more things homeopathy, interviews and segments on the healing possibilities that homeopathy can bring you. And don't forget to visit UK Health Radio online at www.ukhealthradio.com to see the many other amazing shows available to listen live and on demand. Or why not download the app? from the iOS and Android stores. Until next time, stay safe and take care.